Yeah, so, so welcome to uh, today's presentation. My name is uh, Wai Tasseri. Um, this is, I've been, my background is mechanical engineering and uh, politics, um, and I was heavily involved in the climate change movement. At the time, I thought it was the biggest issue of the century, and I was very much like all in on that issue. And then a couple of years ago, or 2015 more precisely, I uh, came across some, did some research on AI and technology and a bunch of other big issues of the century, and I realized I was a little bit too narrowly focused. So I took the last couple of years to really um, study as wide a range of topics as possible, whether it be cybersecurity or migration or populism and all the rest, and just from my own say, figure out, okay, so what, what should I be campaigning for and why, and what's, what matters in the grand scheme of things, what's uh, the relative importance. So, this presentation is one piece of that. I'm going to be doing six lunch and learns, and they're all based on the content of a book that I'm in the process of writing. Um, and the first purpose of these small presentations is for me to, well, to practice getting content out and to get your feedback to one sense of what makes sense, what is convincing, what isn't. Um, and hopefully for you guys, provide some interesting content that uh, you can learn about uh, as well. So, here we go. So yeah, so you start briefly with the uh, 21st century context, so I'm not going to give the whole presentation on, on why I think uh, what the issue, big picture is, but just a little bit of context. Uh, and then to dive into the specifics of like, what's going on economically these days, what's causing those changes, um, and what does that mean in terms of our lifestyle and in terms of our way of life. Uh, and, and then eventually we'll finish off with, okay, so what kinds of policies could we enact, what kinds of things can we do to Harness these changes to make to build a, a happy life in a positive society, um, despite them or thanks to them, at least working the right. So uh, this is in one chart. Uh, the having put in two or three hours of, of uh, two or three years of, of, of thinking into this, um, what I think the biggest issues of the century are and the relative importance. Welcome, yeah, thank you. Sorry, um, so. I mentioned this on explaining this on film like an hour, three hour presentation. Um, these are my book. Um, but in general, uh, there are roughly five categories I've put in in terms of the potential scope on our human, human, human future. Um, on the bottom, we have big issues that are sort of cyclical, that have been around. We've been through wars, big and small, we've been through recessions. Um, there hasn't been inequality before, there has been you know, more equality before. All these major issues can, can rapidly shape the, the, the century, but on their own, if you look back 200 years from now, what's, what's you know, the grand scheme of things, that probably is more background noise than it is the real story. But any one of them is big enough to disrupt all the rest, so it's still big. Above that, and the part we're going to talk about today, is the fundamental changes to the way we live our lives, and, and those are economic shifts, those are um, interpersonal shifts um, and just the like the, the human reality um, is about to change the century in ways that hasn't happened. Arguably, we haven't really seen that since the Industrial Revolution or since the Agricultural Revolution. These sort of these major phase shifts where we change our our, our way of living. Above that, I put issues like catastrophic risks, so climate change, nuclear war, the type of, of event or series of events that could lead to the collapse of modern civilization, billions of dead, that kind of piece is, is, is really the, yeah, everything could, could end with that piece, that hence the putting it more important. And then the last two, human enhancement and artificial general intelligence, um, I have, there, there are lunch and learn specifically on these topics, actually the next, next week's one is on human enhancement, um, and this is where if you change the human being, and if you change the, what we're capable of, of, of doing and, and um, you, you introduce new forms of intelligence, it changes the game in, in ways that are just completely, everything else changes pretty much. Um, so this is why I roughly set up this context. And so for today, looking at the economic piece and the lifestyle piece uh, of what we can expect, what we're already seeing in, in, in this, this century. Yeah. So, automation, abundance, and 21st century economics. So if you look at the news these days, uh, what do you see? You often see things like uh, you know, the gig economy, you see like the vanishing 9 to 5 job. Um, you, meanwhile, you're also getting pieces of uh, news like you know, the like software is replacing, AI is replacing lawyers, replacing radiologists, it's replacing all these things. Um, and specifically right now, it's, it's replacing the tasks that these professions are doing. These professions still exist for other reasons, such as interpersonal or legal or that kind of stuff. But in terms of the 
um, the actual ability to do stuff, the computers can now beat people at you know, facial recognition, cancer recognition on an X-ray, and a number of other um, what used to be very human-centric tasks. Uh, there's a very good book called The Rise of the Robots by Martin Ford. Um, it's, uh, I guess it's a couple years old now, but it's, it's a good overview of what are these forces shaping um, um, the, like, in terms of automation, like where, where, where we're going with this. Um, now, so the other piece that's going on in parallel is the inequality piece. Um, and this is a little, uh, I guess, even more um, common knowledge, I guess, than, than the automation piece. Um, you know, you've seen the charts of, of you know, the top you know, 1% or top 10% income relative to the rest. Wealth accumulation, uh, Thomas Piketty had his uh, famous uh, wealth of the century explaining how the, if you have wealth accumulation higher than the expansion of the economy, you end up with concentration of wealth. Um, but it's not just the economic inequality we're seeing. We're also seeing a, uh, I guess, a, a competition inequality in the sense that as the world merges together and becomes more and more interconnected, um, you're not just competing against your local uh, rival, you're competing against being on Google's, it's on Google's stage. So if you're a musician, you're not just, you know, it's not just your band you know, competing for time and, and space against uh, local other bands. Um, you're also you know, competing against Coldplay, against you know, Renata and all, all the other global, you know. Um, and you see this um, on, on the internet as well in terms of like bloggers, um, like the small percentage of bloggers get the vast amount of readership. Um, and then you have like that, everyone else, everyone else. Um, and in terms of things like uh, online ad revenue, part of the reason why you know Canadian newspapers and newspapers around the world are suffering is because I think it's something like 40% of ad revenue is now going to Facebook or to the Silicon Valley. So that's that's something they're not competing against you know Canadian rivals. It's not like the Toronto Star taking money from you know uh, the National Post. It's you have this massive centralized you know sucking force from Silicon Valley. Um, just because they have the, the better platform, they have the tools, and, and it's just it's more practical for them to use it. So um, there's a sense of like the winner takes it all on the global stage, um, and it becomes you're not up against your fellow person, you're up against the best in the world. And so it becomes very difficult to monetize the things, um, especially in the information sector. So um, another piece, though, meanwhile, so I guess sort of the better news um, is that uh, the costs of Many, many items are plummeting. Um, and here's um, the, the, if you look at you know, the, the cost of computing a power, you're plummeting down by more law. If you look at the cost of sequencing gen gen genomes, it's plummeting even more than um, the cost of computing. Uh, everywhere you look, there are new technologies um, making things that used to be scarce abundant. Uh, and there's a really good book, uh, Abundance by Peter Diamandis, sort of the reference book on this. Um, and the, 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 the cover is just sort of wrapped in, in aluminum foil, at least that's the way it's supposed to look. And the story around that is aluminum, a, cu a couple hundred years ago, used to be more expensive by far than gold and platinum and silver. Um, and people, and it's burning the kings and queens, would serve their best guests with like aluminum cutlery, and the lesser guests would get the gold cutlery. Um, and through various processes, now aluminum is so cheap that you, you know, wouldn't think twice about just throwing out after, you know, big amount of sheep of, of Make some cookies on a sheet of paper of uh, aluminum foil and just throw it out. And this is happening in, in a lot of areas, and even like areas where like food and, and um, uh, other commodities, we're seeing that like, if it hasn't happened already, there are technologies in place right now that are being developed right now that are going to lead to it. So um, I have the, the photo of the food in the background is just the idea of when you go into a supermarket today. Pretty much everywhere you go, you'll see thousands and thousands of items, most of which are affordable. Um, and that is a huge change in terms of historically. Um, and it's also likely to continue in that, on that trend. So, uh, what's, so what's causing all these changes? What's, what's the, uh, the inequality and, and the, the labor changes? Um, there is a lot, there are many factors. There are government policies, there are you know, cultural values, all these things going on, globalization. Uh, but I would argue um, that the, what's really happening, especially the speed in the, over the last 10 years, is what they call the fourth industrial revolution. That's this package of technologies all coming out, being developed at once. Machine learning, Internet of Things, blockchain, you know, autonomous vehicles, 3D printing, agriculture, you know, every sector has their own version of some major breakthrough. 
a lot of it's still in the early stages, um, but as we go over the next five, 10 years, it's likely to accelerate um, and we're gonna see more and more disruption, more and more uh, drop in the cost of goods, likely more and more uh, concentration of, of uh, power and abilities in those who have, who have that, that global dominant position. Um, and uh, more and more difficult for human beings to find jobs that uh, or do perform tasks that a computer or a robot can do better. So, um, now, if you look at the long term, so what, what is, you know, if you, what is the logical conclusion of these trends? Like where, where do they head? Um, and this is, these are the two uh, sort of big pieces in my, in my mind, and I'll explain why. So on the left, do you recognize what the, uh, to, it's, what they call it is, well, it's, in Star Trek they call it a replicator, um, but it's, it's a, a atomically precise 3D printer, basically. Uh, and, and in theory, uh, once the technology is there, you should be able to take your garbage, um, put it into an atomically precise recycler, break it down to base elements of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and all the rest, and then feed those base elements into this machine, and it'll build you a TV, it'll build you your food, it'll build you anything physical good, that, that you know, material good. And unless that seem like science fiction, um, that's essentially what you know, biology does all the time. Like when you think of, you know, when you, you know, um, like a plant uh, takes, you know, nitrogen, oxygen from the soil, you know, uh, absorbs it, turns it into these complex forms. Um, the most advanced, you know, manufacturing device, as Mark would say, but, it, you know, the, the female body in terms of like, a pregnant woman eats, you know, a salad, you know, uh, bread, whatever, breaks it down into base elements and reconstitutes it as a, you know, a, a child, which is you know, the most complex form we could possibly imagine. So these, this technology is, is this idea of we can manipulate matter at its atomic level and build anything we want is, we know it exists, it's just a matter of, of being able to develop it. Um, so it's a matter of time, not a matter of if. Um, and what that means is that you would never need to buy a physical good ever again. Um, because even if your atomic precise, you know, replicator breaks down, you can build yourself a new one, right? Or you can ask a neighbor to build you a new one. Um, and as long as you have the, the, the raw materials, which you can get mostly from recycling, the energy you can get from renewable energy, um, and of course solar panels would be that much more efficient if they were atomically precisely manufactured. Um, so it's, it's pretty much one of these things where once you get that, it's the end of goods production from an economic standpoint. So that's the physical side. Um, on the cognitive side, AGI is artificial general intelligence. It's the holy grail of AI. It's when you get to a point where AI can outperform human beings. Sorry, what do you mean by the end of uh, production economic, uh, from an economic standpoint? Like, in the sense that... There will still need people to build the machine and there will still be... Uh, well, you still, the thing is once you have one machine, that machine can build the other machines, right? So oh, okay. there's a sense of like once it's set up, um, you really wouldn't have to buy anything anymore. Um, you, you could still want to. You could still, for example, yeah. you could have, you know, say I prefer to have a you know, human crafted you know, pottery river. Um, yeah, yeah. So and you'll yeah. have to buy the designs of what you're going to build, right? Because you're sure, not yeah. be able to. Exactly, yeah. Um, and there'll be different types of objects just the way they are today, so you'll buy the different designs. Yes, yeah. But it, presumably there'll be some kind of Wikipedia for all the basic designs you need. Um, and you know, there again, with the information technology, you know, there will be some kind of bid torrent for you know, you know, getting that cherry one to you know. Um, yeah. So that's the thing. We're, we're, the technology is pushing towards an area where it's 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 extremely difficult to be able to sell any physical good. Um, this could, by the way, take 50, 50 years. You know, it's a highly highly complex. There's a lot of detail, but we know it's possible. Um, and it could. There are lots of approaches you can take to it, either through biotechnology approach. Um, genetically modifying existing plants to start producing stuff that you want, um, or more on the, on the 3D printing side. Um, basically, on the one hand, we're racing to that. On the other side, the AGI, that's, that's the, basically AI that can outperform human beings at all tasks, including the task of making other intelligence, like artificial intelligence. So you could get a system where, um, basically think of it as, as a giant calculator that solves problems. So. Say you have you want to deal with you know climate change, you could ask a a AGI system to um, design a a global approach to climate change that would actually incentivize people to want to do it. 
Um, you could solve a lot of highly, highly complex global issues with this. Um, and, and, but at an economic level, on uh, a more basic fundamental level, um, pretty much every cognitive task that human does could be done by AGI. Um, so that, that's the point where it's, it's not so much even you know, that the creativity or human emotion or the rest plays in. At this point, an AGI could be even better at working with human beings than human beings. It could be even more caring. It could be all those things that we would program into it to be able to uh, um, do better than us. So in the long run, um, we're headed towards a world of essentially no marketable labor and essentially no marketable um, production of, of goods and services. So what does that mean? Um, well, it can mean some very interesting things. There's a very good book uh, called The Zero Marginal Cost Society by Jeremy Rifkin. It came out a few years ago. Um, and he really explains so the zero marginal cost is the idea that, uh, like especially with the information age right now, once you, you know, make the first song and record it, it's essentially free to just mass produce it. And so you can't really make money off selling music that easily anymore because it's, it's, it's a, an information good. It's just, it's, there's no cost to it. Um, the post-capitalism is another one that's by Paul Mason sort of deals with that. So looking at the, the what already, we already see in the information world it is very, very difficult to monetize information. Um, and as we see, with, and, and in terms of advancing towards um, nanotechnology, um, um, the Radical Abundance book really talks about the, the impact of that, the, the replicator, the nanotechnology replicator. Um, they're again extremely difficult to sell a good if people can make it at home for free um, or can access it for free online. Now, so, it, so, so basically what, what it means is that the capitalism as we know it may well succeed so well as to make itself um, mostly uh, absent uh, in the sense that there are still going to be some things that you can't um, disrupt with technology, something like that property, real estate, um, you, so far, I mean, maybe through virtual reality or some other, you might know, be able to, you know, um, uh, solve that technology, but I think that there, anything in terms of our, our, our lifestyle, like that that's, you know, a good or service or, or information or energy, um, we can essentially count on as, as getting for free. Um, and that, that also means that we'll have very little to do from an economic standpoint. Um, and so these, yes, yeah, so the, the, these, all three of these books really dis discuss the possibilities of what the 21st century economy looks like, um, and um, essentially it means a very, very, very different economy and, and, and uh, lifestyle. Specifically, these are the types of things that mean. So technological unemployment I've touched on. Um, this is, uh, I'll go into a little bit detail in the next slides in terms of like, uh, is it actually happening this time because there's evidence that, that we're still very at low unemployment. Um, the, the second piece that could mean is the gig economy, uh, which is likely to be more of a transition than a final stage. And this is not so much a, a sign of a growing new sector of the economy as a sign of an economy that's slowly phasing out, as I currently know it. The third piece is uh, what Yuval Harari uh, talks a lot about. Um, it's, it's the sense of this global useless class, where we'll have a growing number of people who simply don't have anything to offer that the market will pay for. Um, and this can have a lot of implications uh, in terms of civil society, in terms of, you know, the, well, first of all, morale of, of you know, the, of, of human beings, um, but also in terms of there's some danger, danger around, uh, like, power issues of, like, in the past, even dictatorships had to, in some, at some level, listen to the people because they still needed the people to defend them against the other people. Um, there's still a sense of still need security guards, so basically, so basically uh, you couldn't do away with uh, a large percent of the population. If we get to the point where, it, where automation really does make you know 60 or 70 percent of the population redundant, that does make create some scary scenarios where you could have um, really like a, a not only would they, they be useless economically, but on top of that, they, you know, they'd be very helpless in terms of their their power over those who had the technologies and and the um, the remaining knowledge. It was a lot of, I'm not clearing very well here, but it's a, a lot of very dangerous situations could, could come from this. Um, and as part of this transition, I mean, it's not going to happen overnight. And, um, you have this, the inequality growing, where, like, as we're seeing even right now, uh, if you have a PhD in math and computer science, 
um, you can be guaranteed a very, very well-paying job. Um, if you don't have that, it's getting more and more difficult to find work. Um, and there's still some, fortunately, there's still some low-skill jobs like for, or, or low-education uh, jobs in terms of um, landscaping or a lot of manual labor that you really can't automate very easily right now. Um, but, uh, and so it's not going to be this uniform of only those who are, have the, the highest levels of, of, of education that will get jobs, but there is, when you look at the data, the, it's going to hit the middle class and, and, and the, the lower class much, much harder in terms of like the, the jobs that are going to get automated, the tasks going to get automated are going to be more likely to be simple tasks um, than the ones that are at the high end of the uh, design machines. Um, do you yes, think yeah. it's also going to hit a part of the upper class that is not in technology jobs, basically? Would they, like a lot of the, like, I don't know about civil servants, about, for example, international organizations like the UN, yeah. that are yeah. more and more, I mean, we're not sure what, what their use is, um, but do you think any of these, like, political science or international relations or, you know, yeah. non-technical yeah. graduates will be yeah. hit or not? Or will they be able to protect since they're already in positions of power, will they be able to protect their... Well, those who already have wealth can use their wealth to maintain that there's, there's a, the advantage of having the, the you know, investments and capital gains and that stuff. But, but the, on the... I see you mentioned political science and, and, and UN and stuff, because I think the, yeah. the one area where we could see a growth of, of importance just because it's essential is global coordination, um, because a lot of these issues have to be solved through coordination. So that, yeah. Um, and there's also a lot of questions around like the ethics and philosophy of how you apply these technologies, which is starting to just now become noticed in the news, and there is a little more investment in you know, the ethics of AI, um, and uh, it's still like 100 to 1 in terms in of... France, the, there's a big trust for that. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And I think even within like the companies like Google, there's a push for, okay, we're realizing, okay, we're, we're disrupting society by quite a bit here, maybe we should you know, invest a little bit more in think through how it, yeah. Um, so, so you're, you're thinking, yeah. yeah, that these large organizations would find a way to play a role. They would be the ones managing this coordination. They might be well, the, the, they'll certainly be a big player. Uh, who, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. Mm -hmm. um, for example, there is like the partnership on AI, which is a uh, in, uh, industry alliance along with all the big um, mm -hmm. AI firms trying on how to yeah. make sure it's a uh, yeah. positive impact. But um, basically, back to your initial question, I mean, it, it is tough to know exactly which jobs are going to be relevant in five ten years. Um, but there are, and I ran out of time with the, to put a slide together with, with the chart of um, which jobs are like most likely to get. But there's, if you look at the chart, typically it's, it's if you have a post bachelor degree, you're much safer than everybody else. Um, yeah, and, on average, yeah, but I was yeah, wondering yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But I mean, there's jobs like lawyers, um, radiologists, you know, highly skilled people who right. are suddenly redundant. Um, there again, it'll, it, it's not going to play out perfectly linearly because there could be laws saying, well, sure, the AI system will be doing the decision as to whether or not it's a cancer or not, but you still need a person to talk to the patient and to make a decision and, and to sign off on the legal, you know. So there's a lot of, it's, it's, it's very, it's a highly complex and massive thing happening. We don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. All we do know is that technologically, the tools are there to replace most labor, um, um, and increasingly so as time goes on. Um, and so then, and the last, uh, so, so the, the increasing inequality, um, like the, the sort of dooms, the, 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 the scenario people are worried about is that you have um, a handful of geeks in Silicon Valley pulling in all the money, making seven figures, and everybody else unemployed. Um, and we're, we're already starting to see a little bit of that in terms of, you know, the, the, the salaries in Silicon Valley are much, much higher than everywhere else. Um, uh, and, and you have like actually in San Francisco itself, you have uh, the uh, whole bunch of homeless right next to the you know literally next to the to the, the wealth of the um, of the tech companies. There's that sense of yeah, the, there's accumulation of, of importance, wealth, power, knowledge into a smaller and smaller elite, regardless of of, of initial um, like money. This is purely on, on the intellectual side. Uh, and as, as mentioned, so the cost of goods. Uh, the, it is likely we're heading into a world where more and more things become cheaper um, and accessible. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit more about technological unemployment because uh, you know if you look at the chart of jobless rates in Canada over the last five years, it has dropped you know by what two or three percent, um, and that does not look like a chart of technological unemployment. Um, there's also been for since the ever since the industrial revolution, there's been talk about how robots are going to take our jobs. It has not happened yet. Um, if you go to you know, a, 
find a job today. Um, you're not going to find um, full-time jobs, uh, but you'll definitely find jobs. Uh, however, there is some early evidence, even in Canada and Ontario today, um, despite those unemployment numbers, that we are seeing some early signs of technological unemployment. So, on top is the unemployment rate, so you can see it bobs around up and down. Um, and below is the more interesting one, which is the labor force participation. So these are people who are 25 to 54, could be working full time, um, but as you see over the graph over the last 40 years or so, um, the men have been significantly dropping, um, and uh, women after having entered the workforce are also starting to plateau and, and reduce their participation. So, more, so that means that more and more people who could be working are simply not looking for work anymore. Um, and that's, so that that's t tells perhaps a little better story than the unemployment rate itself, which just tells you of those who are looking for work, how many haven't found it. So, uh, and this actually came from the Mueller report um, this last week. Um, in Ontario, over the last 10 years, there's been a 5% drop in the labor participation rate. Um, and this is, um, so sort of like, the, the, if, if you're wondering why there's, there's no sign at all of, of technological unemployment, there actually is some sign, and, and we'll see where this goes. Uh, it's hard to predict exactly, but um, I also I'll bring two, two more facts to this. Uh, the first is that over the last 10 years, 94% uh, of all new jobs have been either contract, temporary, or part-time. Only 5% of the jobs created over the last 10 years have been full-time, regular, employee company jobs. Um, and the second is the story of the horse. Um, and the reason I bring it up is because in the 1820s, apparently, when, when, uh, or 1840s, when the railroads are first starting to be put in place, there are no predictions that you know, the horse is gone you know, at the end of the populations of horses because they, before then everything was moved around by horse. Um, but from 1840 to 1929, horse populations actually increased by multiple factors. Uh, and then what was happening was, as railroads came online, the economy started growing, um, and you needed more horses, for example, to offload goods from the trains to the last mile. And so you saw this, this growth of horse population. Um, so horses were useful in, you know, in combination with the new technology even though they were displaced in terms of the... Uh, but then around 1920s, uh, 1910s, 1920s, they sort of peaked, and all of a sudden the population went from... Uh, it declined about three times from the 1920s seven or something to 1950. So it was... It's a story that I think is more relevant to human beings in the sense that, yes, since the Industrial Revolution we've been useful, um, the, the technology has grown the economy, has created new opportunities and new requirements for human labor. But it is also entirely possible that even though we haven't seen unemployment yet, once you reach a certain uh, a threshold where the last remaining tasks that um, technology can't do, something can, that's when you can see a, a phase shift where over a period of you know, 10 years, 5 years, 20 years, you go from 95% you know, unemployment to 10% employment. Um, so there, there is, despite the fact that um, there are isn't any existing evidence of, or very strong evidence of the labor force participation, there is a, a good case to be made that, yes, in the long run, the jobs are, are mostly gone, and especially when you think of nanotechnology and artificial general intelligence. When you get those technologies, it really is game over in terms of being able to uh, uh, do things. So, okay, um, so what should we do? There have been a number of policies uh, suggested, and this, I'm, I'm, so my background is more in the politics side, so I'm thinking more from a policy perspective, um, but um, there's also impacts like, in terms of what we can do personally in our lives. The first thing that keeps coming up, universal basic income. Uh, it's an old idea. Um, it actually was a big deal back in the 60s and 70s, and the US Congress passed the universal basic income law, um, and it failed in the Senate because the Senate Democrats wanted a higher official. Um, so this actually was politically uh, palatable, um, even to the, the, the to conservatives and to people who sometimes you assume wouldn't want it, and, and there are many reasons for it. Um, it's a very efficient way of covering everyone's needs. Um, it respects the freedom of the individual, and, and so so instead of having you know uh, uh, people who are you know in, in financial need having to explain to the government that oh I'm poor enough because or oh I have the ability please give me money. It's just a systematic, you get a check in the mail every month and there's no questions asked. So there's a sense of, of freedom, a sense of just simplification. Uh, to, um, and it's also easy to implement because governments 
aren't very good at very many things, but one of the things government is good at is sending people checks in the mail. Uh, we have our taxation system set up. It's very easy for the government to just you know, send out, you know, do that. Um, shouldn't be any huge fiascos in terms of setting this up um, if we go this way. Um, and it's, it's basic income resolution, it's basically a way of fighting the inequality from a financial standpoint. The cons are it does require a lot of tax increase. Um, depending on the country, it could be to the order of you know sometimes doubling the current taxes we pay. Um, and there again, you can set it up whether it be a pollution tax or whether it be you know more income tax or whether it be that kind of stuff. But um, it takes a lot of money, uh, and it will take political will to make that happen. The other problem with it is that the the the, the problem is trying to solve which is redistribute wealth between those who are making it and those who, who can't anymore is that you know if if the people making it are all in Silicon Valley and the people who can't make money are in Canada or Bangladesh or Argentina, um, you can't just have a national basic income and have it work. You need for it to truly work you need an international global uh, basic income, which um, is another pretty major challenge. Now that's not to say that in the transition time over the next 20, 30 years you could have national programs step in and, and, and mitigate the the, 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 the Impacts, but if we want like a sustainable long term, um, we'll have to think beyond that from orders, which, which is a, a big deal. Um, also, how much is enough, um, and that will, that will depend on a lot of factors. It's a big uh, discussion, um, and it's also unclear. Okay, so you give people money, is that? I mean, it'll solve the wealth, or it'll reduce the wealth inequality issues, but um, is that going to mess with people's psychology? Is it going to be you know people living on handouts? Is that going to you know? There are a lot of unresolved questions on this piece that we don't really know what impact it will have on society. We just hand people for money. So yeah. I see another huge uh, issue, which is of um, putting a really um, an, an oligarchy in power. Uh, it's going back to the medieval ages, basically. Yeah. Because when you're the one, even if they're just giving it to you, somebody's deciding who is giving it to you, and if you're not, you have no choice whether to make money or, or not. Yeah. I see it as a, just a major democratic problem. It's just, yes. it's never spoken about, but it's, yeah. to me it's huge. Absolutely. No, and, 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 uh, so, so, so in my mind, universal basic income is part of the solution, but it's only one small part, um, and it's, it's certainly not sufficient, even if, and not intention that would be very difficult to, to, to implement. But, yeah, uh, I think it's, it's definitely going to have to happen in some form or other, um, unless we won't be able to starve. The second way of going about it is to find a way to, re to uh, reward useful but non-market work. So, one of the things that Gandhi is really bad at is rewarding things like child rearing, rewarding things like environmental cleanup, you know, rewarding things like civic engagement and taking the time to get to know your local candidates and, and really you know, learn about the issues and have an informed opinion. All of these things um, can be dealt with through policy. Um, there have been successful examples in the past of um, maybe not the theories with the Civilian Conservation Corps in the US where they um, you know, the built up national parks and, and you knew a lot of like for example, you know, when you think of the the Great Pacific garbage patch with uh, you know trill billions of tons of garbage floating around the ocean, um, you know, there was plenty of work to be done. It's just a matter of finding a way to to uh, Finance it and, and to make it into uh, um, uh, um, yeah, give, there's a plenty of work for people to do. Basically, it's just a matter of, of going about it in ways that aren't traditional market market mechanisms. There's also talk, and this is from uh, so there's a candidate in the American presidential election for 2020 called Andrew Yang. And he's running on a platform of, of basic income, and he talks also a lot about building a social marketplace. Uh, so finding a way to have a currency for things like volunteering. So Say you get you volunteer an hour of time in your local uh, you know homeless shelter, um, that will give you points that you can use to um, for you know to acquire something else. Um, and so this is a way of, of instead of having the government lead all these projects, make create you know massive neighborhood projects, you could have a a, a non financial economy of, of sorts. Both of these um, I think are doable. Uh, also part of the solution, not the entire solution, um, but uh, the. The, I mean, the advantage of having people with a lot of free time on their hands is that they will have time to talk about things like, okay, how do we, you know, we talk about when you get involved in democracy, 
to, and, and to talk about the future, the future, okay, so if we are going to build, you know, forms of intelligence that are smarter than us, if we are going to, you know, to, to design, to say, if we start modifying, you know, human beings, all of these really complicated, scary discussions we'll have time to discuss um, if we are unemployed. So, um, just finishing up here, so this is a uh, Alongside the practical things of you know either maker projects and and uh, having a neighbor's basic income, there's also the cultural and psychological shift of so what what is meaningful life like right now we, we derive a lot of meaning from our work you know um, you know the, and, and if you don't have work you feel like well, I'm useless or I'm, you know there's uh, so a lot of people sense of self you know ask them what, you know what, what they do they'll be able to say oh I'm a engineer or I'm a and that's their their identity um, it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, there are examples in today's world um, where people have um, they, they find meaning in ways and things like sports, which is not a you know quote unquote useful you know it's, you know it's a game. Um, the uh, another case scenario is, is that apparently the happiest, some of the happiest people in the world are the ultra orthodox Jewish men in Israel who they don't apparently they don't work a day in their life, but they do basically focus on spirituality and on um, um, the, it's basically all about religion. Basically, it's an entire. It, it, and it's, it's very intense and it's very. There's a lot of meaning wrapped around all the activities they do. Um, there again, it's not economical, practical work, but it's it's. You can live a happy, meaningful life doing things that are not um, what we traditionally assume to be meaningful. And the last piece, creating digital life. I keep coming back to this because this is going to be important for the next uh, few um, uh, lunch and learns. Uh, this idea of you know. We're, we're reaching the point where you know human beings are the limiting factor, um, and where we can start creating new life, whether that be through biotechnology in a lab or whether that be through modifying human beings. Um, and there could be a lot of meaning in the sense of um, you know handing over the baton to a new species, or uh, at least being part of the life process in a way that we haven't been before. And last piece, and just uh, going back to the earlier point, global coordination, to make this all work, um, there will likely have to be, some, there already is global coordination on, on, on things like tax havens and, and trying to reduce um, uh, the distortions around uh, companies like Google and Facebook having headquarters in Ireland so they can avoid paying taxes in the US. Um, if we want to build an equitable you know, society, we're going to have to think globally, um, and, and it will mean um, things like basic income and you know uh, wealth inequality will probably have to have some kind of global solution. Technology governments, how we implement AI, if we want to avoid an AI arms race and a lot of dangers that can go with that. Um, obviously, shared risks like climate change, pandemics, uh, nuclear war. I mean, everything that really matters this century is global. Global coordination is is, is just something that we can't get around um, if we want to succeed. Uh, there you go, back to that one. So that's the recap. Um, uh, as I pointed out, expect a very, very different economy and way of life. Um, the timeline is, is very difficult to know, but 20 years from now, it would not be surprising to me if a large percentage, say 30% of the population, was employed um, or employed in, 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 under non economic work. Um, it would not be surprising to me if cost of goods and services and information and energy are significantly lower than they are today to the point of being close to free. Um, it would also not surprise me if inequality got radically worse and we don't deal with it in terms of, both in terms of you know, the haves and have-nots in terms of wealth, but also in terms of education, um, in terms of you know, usefulness remaining, in terms of uh, the uh, remaining work. Um, and all these things, while technology is driving what can be done, at the end of the day, what we do as a society, what choices we make, what political decisions we make, um, really does matter. Um, you know, whether we put in a, a UBI system or not, will have a big impact on people's lives. Will you know have impact on inequality? And, and, and so I, I think the, the there are plenty of things we can do. We're heading into a world that could be very, very beautiful in terms of having you know time to do whatever you want, um, access to whatever you want. But um, it could also be a nightmare in terms of having this extremely inequal uh, world where you know, most people are left behind and some people are living behind closed you know, uh, gated communities. So that is roughly a message for uh, automation events in the 21st century economics. Um, do you have any questions? <laughs>
already asked some of mine. Exactly, that's a good, good question. Yeah, thanks for yeah, yeah. Was anything unclear or any parts that were you're like uh, doesn't quite find convincing or there any that's uh Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of reading up too. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of the, the, the books that I that put in there are ones that really sort of shape my view on it, and, and you know, if, if they turn out to be significantly wrong, then I'll have to update my own views as well. But I, 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 from what I've seen, I haven't come across any arguments that really put any of this completely, completely wrong. Um, a lot of questions around timeline, um, and, and as I mentioned in the initial charts, there are so many other things going on. You could have, you know, a nuclear war, you could have all these things that could completely change what's going on here. So um, this is sort of, if all else continues roughly as it is, this is what we can expect. And, um, um, and um, so yeah, so, so I mean, personally, I, I'm, I'm very, very cautiously optimistic that we can make it into a um, better society than we have now. Um, but I do think it could be, yeah, I, I have no illusions as to how difficult it would be and how poorly it could go if we don't to take action and then do the episode. Yeah. Well, it kind of seems like there's not really much to do. Like, for the general person, you kind of just need to wait and see what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's more just being aware. It is very aware. And also, I mean, yeah, not beating yourself up if you can't find a job because, you know, it's the, you know it's the, you're fighting against forces that are beyond your control. Um, but I, yeah, I think the the, the I think the biggest work, personally, uh, for, for individuals is really to, to, to think through, you know, what matters in your life. You know, if, if you are, if you aren't going to have, you know, say, if you're 20 years from now, you're going to have a job. Um, what really matters to you? How do you define your own meaning? And, and, and like, what kind of, uh, and also, what kind of society do you want to live in? I mean, you know, if, 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 if um, do you is inequality a big deal to you personally? I mean, are you okay with some people being, you know, 100 times wealthier than others or a million times wealthier than others? Um, and, and how much you know, regulation do you want you know, government to be, you know, because um, you could have like, a system where government just, you know, takes a really hands-on thing and tries to micromanage everything, or you could have a society where you have more libertarian, where everyone sort of does their own thing, and, and uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of approaches to this, but it's true, yeah, in terms of, like, personal uh, things to do, it's mostly around the, like, how you vote and how you approach your own life, that, that's, uh, yeah, um, I don't, there isn't really any way to outsmart the, well, you can definitely harness the, these areas, like, for example, you know, if you want to, to improve your odds of getting a job, you know, get a job in an area like AI or some new technologies that's exploding, um, and, and, um, and there are new jobs you create all the time, like, the new, uh, one of my favorite jobs nowadays is, is I see around is, um, virtual reality host, um, right. these virtual exitors, and they, they have another, the, uh, you walk into them and they, you know, at the host stage and you see all the various you know, the gadgets they have and uh, explains all the roles and stuff. And, and like, that job did not exist you know, five years ago. So, uh, yeah, I guess yeah, the practical advice is just to keep your eye you know, on what's happening and, and um, yeah, uh, move fast because, you know, for all we know, virtual reality hosts could be jobs that go, you know, uh, in five years. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty mind boggling to see. Uh, I like think, yeah, how we can think of these things, like, you know, I guess the next step would be what structures are thinking about this, who is, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and then the real, real big problem right now is that there's almost no one at the political level talking about this. Um, and, and, like, the, we need discussions to get going now because it's going to take time to get, you know, consensus around the BI, that kind of stuff. Um, and I've yet to see any party in Canada take it seriously. Um, there's one political candidate in the U.S. right now taking it seriously. Um, but yeah, uh, it's... it's uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, because then, um, yeah, the thinking is left to the tech guys, right? Mm -hmm. Since they're the ones building the AI, right? So if they're the only ones thinking <coughs> about it, and they're thinking with their prism, which has been yeah. what we've seen for the past 20 years, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. We're going to have to live with their decision. Exactly. So... <laughs> well, and I think that there is a space for... Their you know, vision of the world. Yeah. Um, which is quite particular. Absolutely. Very Californian, very yeah. liberal, libertarian. Yes. And yeah. yeah, so we're just going to have to live with that if nobody, like, uh, in France, to put together this task force for these scientists to think yeah. about how to make AI work for society. Yeah. And so they have this super mathematician 
was yeah. thinking about it and brought together these hundreds of people to talk about it. Who was the last name there again? Uh, Cédric uh, Villani. Cédric Villani. Okay, yeah, sure. He did a whole uh, research on the future of AI uh, for okay. France and yeah. what it was going to mean. And now I don't know what the next steps are, but yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, <laughs> but at yeah. least they thought yeah. about it. They thought, what do we want with AI? Yes. Not what the engineers want. Well, and, and, and to be fair, the engineers, some of them are actually reaching out and, and teaching I'm philosophers sure and that oh, yes. thing. So, yes, so yes. you know, we realize it's a big deal. We're not sure how to, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I agree. I agree. So, uh, I agree. And that's that's the best thing. Yeah, I think yeah. he worked with engineers, of course. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But not necessarily like within a company, you know, where you have yeah. some constraints where yeah. you, know, you can't do anything you want. Because the well, company has yeah. to make profit, right? Well, and this thing that they're, they're, even though they want to, with the best of intentions, there's still a lot of pressure, like, especially in the military, I mean, they're developing autonomous weapons because they're afraid of if they don't, the Chinese will, or if they, yeah. they, you know. So there's a sense of the, and dealing with that arms race is going to need global coordination and a sense of global trust, which fortunately is becoming more and more possible thanks to technology. Um, and yeah. through all three things like um, transparency and cybersecurity, it's very, very difficult to hold a secret nowadays. Really? Um, and, and, and well, especially as you get towards neurotechnology where the interfacing with the brain and the and computers, um, it is, in the long run, we'll be at the point where we can directly read human thoughts, um, which is a scary thought, but it also means that... I knew it was coming. <laughs> yeah, um, but it also means that if you want you know, the Chinese military to trust the American military, if they can read each other's thoughts, that actually does provide some hard you know, um, possibility of trust, uh, which before wasn't possible, right? Um, and even today with facial recognition of a lot of you know, uh, the other metrics, you can get a pretty clear idea if someone's lying or not. Um, and, and they're given cybersecurity, I mean, even the most advanced militaries can't protect their secrets anymore, so it's, it's tough to... Uh, so yeah, so there, there's some hope in that too. All these technologies have both these incredible downsides and incredible upsides, and it's like, can we harness them? You know, can we, you know? <laughs> well, something that I kind of question is like, why do we need this artificial general intelligence? Because it seems like artificial intelligence is really good for automated things we already do, and it's really good for solving problems we already have. <coughs> I don't really see the need for something that just all encompasses solves everything, unless our entire goal is to just give up all of our time. <laughs> like I, I don't really see yeah. why we would build that. Yeah. 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 Well, there, there are a number of reasons. For, but, I mean, I'll get into them. There's a whole. Uh, I think in November 30th is the lunch and learn on specifically that. Um, but the. the there's a huge first mover advantage in terms of um, if you build it, you can use it to make yourself a fortune or to, you know, there's a lot of private reasons to build one, build one. Yeah, there's a lot of profit and um, and, and also, I mean, there are a lot of problems that are simply too complex for the human brain to understand um, and will need much smarter than human intelligence to be able to grapple with them. Um, things like, you know, um, arguably even if a, you know, a large enough asteroid or comet showed up on the horizon, would we be actually be able to stop it? Um, Having a super intelligent uh, information system would be very, very useful. Um, so there's a sense of like, in terms of a human survival in the long run, we may well need um, much more than human. So it would be kind of like an adaptive infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and there again, we use a whole other discussion that I don't want to pass time here in the room, but um, we're past the. Um, but um, yeah. I would say come to that uh, that lunch you learned. Um, it's up on the meetup page. I'll add it to the uh, CSI as well because uh, that's that is the.